Thank you. You know, right from the outset, I, I don't like this slide. Uh, it's probably too late to edit it. Uh, but it says, examining the power of thought. And I'm, I'm not sure if we're examining the power of thought here. I don't know if we're examining the power of consciousness. I don't know if we're examining the power of intention, attention. I'm not sure what we're examining, but, but we're, we're going to have an interesting uh, ride as we go through. I'm also not thrilled with the idea of energy healing. So I don't like anything about this slide. I don't even like my name. So the the the... The, the energy, I think you call me Fred or something like that. So, so the uh, energy healing implies that we have an energy that we can isolate. And, and I don't know of any energy that's been isolated yet. So I'm making this up. I don't know much about healing, and I have no idea why you're listening to me. I mean, I do experiments, and sometimes I do them at two inches, and sometimes I do them at 2,000 miles. I get the same results. Should... Is that energy? You know, I mean, we, we got to think about this, but take some of this stuff with certain grains of salt. I, I have, my book is called The Energy Cure. The publisher said to me, uh, this, is the, this is the cover, and we're going to call it The Energy Cure. I said, oh, they, I said, I don't think it's energy. And they said, uh, thanks for your input. <laughs> no? Yes? Uh, first, special thanks to everybody here. Uh, I mean, this is an amazing staff, top to bottom. Uh, everybody here has been treated wonderfully, and bravo to all. So the ICLIF has some areas of interest that dovetail with mine. Uh, uh, I see from the literature and such, you're very much interested in the power of human thought. And we're going to look at it, quibbling over whether there's a thought involved, but we're going to be looking at some healing experiments, uh, which probably human thought's in there someplace. Uh, Icliff is also interested in connections, and I could, I could do four or five lectures on the side about connections, some pretty interesting data. Uh, the only thing I'm going to probably show you here is some EEG data and some functional MRI data, which indicates that, in fact, humans can connect at a distance. And the whole thing will be... Uh, surrounding one way or another the idea of human energy. My agenda for the last too many years uh, has been these. And the first is uh, the investigation of the parameters of healing. Again, I'm going to try to avoid saying energy healing. So, again, we don't know too much about healing. It happens, but really what happens, uh, we're, not, we're not really sure. So. For example, if somebody does a hands-on treatment, what's the dosage? How much do you need? Does a half-hour treatment, is that half of an hour treatment? Is a treatment by a human the same each time they do it? What does it take? Does belief matter? Does it matter if the healer believes? Does it matter if the healee believes? Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter? I, so all of these things are, are all researchable questions, and I'm not going to deal with most of them, but you, you want to be thinking about, yeah, healing's going to happen, and you're going to see that pretty clearly, but wh what are the conditions under which it happens, and how do we increase its efficacy? Uh, these are really, we can spend, I could give everybody here 10 research assignments, and you could spend the rest of your life trying to figure all this stuff out. I'm interested in the physiological correlates of healing, so I have brain data. Um, and I don't know whether healing's related to the brain. So we have a brain bias. Some of us use them. Some don't. Have you ever dealt with freshmen? But since we have the toys, we hook, e we hook the brains up. We take EEGs. We do functional MRIs. We do all that kind of stuff. And so there, I have some data on the physiological correlates of healing. I don't know that they're the cause of healing. I could at least say they're the correlates of healing. Maybe healing happens, and then there's a brain consequence. Maybe the state of mind doesn't matter. Maybe the state of mind is a consequence of healing, not the cause of healing. I'm not making a proposition, nor a preposition. I'm simply trying to suggest that we don't really know. But what I'd like you to think about, just generally, is all of the assumptions that we ordinarily make without really having it nailed down. And so I like to keep stuff up in the air and know what I know and 
be pretty straightforward about the stuff I don't know. At the very end of uh, today, I'm going to talk about some possibilities, anyway, of practical applications. Can we bottle it? So healing using these unorthodox techniques seems to produce pretty remarkable stuff. But can we take the healer out of the equation, bottle the stuff, and turn it into a conventional therapy? It's a pretty interesting idea. And so far, we've got some indication, yeah, that might be the case. Development of, uh, or investigation of teaching, efficacy, I'm going to kind of duck here. And the scientific mother load here would be the last bullet, which is the development of a theoretical model. This would mean we scientifically have some real basis to understand, explain, predict. And I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. So it's a goal, but it's not one that I, I anticipate uh, solving this week. I don't have any proprietary information. I don't have, in other words, you know, the secret in my pocket or something like that. Uh, the, uh, both of these are available in the back. It's not a sales pitch. One is a story. Another is the actual techniques I use in my experiments. So anybody here is free to know what I know, try it yourself, make your own lab, test it on people, plants, animals, vegetables, minerals, play. Um, and so I encourage as much as possible uh, people to go out and try this stuff. Uh, the stuff. I'd, I'd just like to make a, a comment. Uh, the image on the right, hands-on healing, and this is a training course in, in what's called the energy cure. Again, that came from the publisher. But the techniques that I use are not healing techniques. And that, that needs to be clear. In other words, they're really based on a mental imaging technique I helped to develop. It involves extremely rapid mental imaging. And I mean, you, nobody would believe how fast you can mentally image if you practice a lot. It takes a lot of practice to learn my stuff. It's extremely fast mental imaging. Some people use this imaging and then apply it to healing. Some people use this imaging and, I don't know, do leadership stuff. Some people use this imaging and, and use it to build biz businesses. I'm using it to investigate healing. It has widespread use. And basically, it's a technique of mental imaging which is alleged to get you what you want. If one of the things you want is to heal, you can use it for healing. If one of the things you want is to make your business bigger, make it bigger. If it's, you know, again, you can keep going. So it's, it, it says hands-on healing, but the hands-on healing technique is one application of this mental imaging. The mental imaging can be used for anything. Today, limited time, essentially three questions. Can we take inexperienced, non-healers, not believers, and train them to cure cancer in a lab? Straightforward question. Sometimes I use myself as the healer, though I'm not a healer. Sometimes I use other faculty. Sometimes I use student volunteers. But I've never used anyone in my experiments who are card-carrying healers. I've never used someone who said, oh, yeah, I believe that stuff. So if I go and I'm, I'm scanning for volunteers for my healing experiments, uh, what do you think? Here's the deal. And if you say, oh, yes, I, I believe that, I, I say, get away from me. Believers scare me. I'm not one. I'm a skeptic. Means, let's find out. I'm not trying to defend a belief. Believers come in all stripes. I know this is true. I know this is crap. So I've spoken, for example, to skeptic societies. And I, I come in, and I'm going to present some of my data. And they're all sitting there like this, like this. Like this. And they're grumbling, and they've got frowns on their faces and all this stuff. And I usually start this by just nudging them. And I say, you know, I'm the only skeptic in the room. And they say, no, no, we're the skeptic society. I say, you're not skeptics. You're mindless believers. You know everything I haven't yet said is wrong. And you're going to go to the grave trying to defend that I'm wrong, even though you have no idea what I'm about to say. And I said, you all scare the hell out of me. Now, I can also talk to a group, and they go, oh, yes, that's the most amazing. I said, get away from me. You shouldn't be believing this stuff. Does healing happen? If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You don't, if you're talking about belief, wrong, wrong ballgame. So first question, can inexperienced non-healers be trained to cure cancer in a laboratory? Straightforward question. 
is there a relationship between healing connection? We're going to look at some data on that. And a question, is healing related to intention? And I could ask a subset, is healing related to attention? And I'm going to make a distinction between a kind of a willing psychokinetic effect and simply intention. And the bottom line, looking ahead, will be, I don't think we can force our will to make healing happen the way we want it to, though we can intend healing to happen. But the means by which you get from point A to healing, I don't control. It, it's not up to what I want. So what I want, you know, it's, it's nice, but uh, it doesn't seem to matter all that much. So let's deal with question one. Or not. Okay. Uh, I'm going to deal with mice. It's a nice, tight model. And what you have here is, I've done a whole bunch. I'm not going to talk about all of them, because I understand I only have, Michelle, you said I only have four and a half hours? Is that right? <laughs> and no breaks if it's down to four and a half hours. So I have, uh, up there you'll see City University of New York, and it says two exper. That means I've done two formal experiments at City University, two at St. Joseph's College, one at Arizona, three at University, you get the idea. I've done these experiments in five medical schools, eight labs total. And one of the reasons I go from lab to lab is I, if, if it works, since I don't believe this stuff, since it works, the lab must be screwy, you know? Let's go find a, let's go find where, I, get, give me a lab where it doesn't work, you know? Because this, this is too much. So I've got a bunch of experiments on mammary cancer, sarcomas, Oncogenic mice, I got a racy series on nude mice. There's probably not many of you who have seen mice clothed, but you know, so, so, so I, I have nude, I have uh, extremely aggressive cancer, I have in vitro, I'm keep, I can keep going. So there, I got a, a boatload, and again, if Michelle will give me more than four and a half hours, we'll get into some detail. So let's look at the first, just as an example. And these are going to be disgusting. Uh, it, it's very good that we're not doing, well, actually, you, we probably don't want a break. Nobody's going to want anything after they look at this. The only thing that matters here is the last line. Host survival, 14 to 27 days. This is a standard animal model. If there's a biologist in the room, they know exactly what's up there. It's, it's biological gobbledygook. And it means strain, type, source, all this kind of stuff. This is the most studied animal model ever in anything. There are literally thousands of experiments, thousands, on these mice. Thousands of published experiments. Who knows how many tens of thousands. And here's the short version. You get a mouse, you're going to see it in a second. You get a mouse, you inject it with cancer. 14 days later, some will die. 15 days, some more will die. 16 days, some more will die. No mouse will live past 27 days. That's it. That's all. And it forms a beautiful normal curve. It really does. Standard deviation, three days. Plus or minus three days, two-thirds of them are dead. A thousand experiments. So this is an off-the-shelf, if you've been to any oncology lab person, they know exactly what this is. No mouse, here's the bottom line, no mouse has ever lived past 27 days. So you do whatever you do, you give it, you give it, you give it, you try it, you radiate it, you do it, and no mouse. So Methuselah is 27 days. So, whoops. I'm going to show you the progression. I'm, I'm probably pointing this in the wrong place. That would be the mouse. This is a, a particularly easy model to work with. It's all external, it doesn't metastasize, so it just grows bigger and bigger. So you're going to see ugly stuff here. I don't have a pointer that works, but you can see this mouse is down to three legs. The tumor has eaten one leg. You don't have to be a biologist to see that the fur is not looking good. If you could see the eyes, the eyes aren't looking good. This mouse is not going to live. And so basically what happens is the tumor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The mouse dies to one of two ways. The internal, the internal organs are crushed and or it, it saps the energy out of the rest of the system. It dies of malnutrition, usually a combination. It's a really ugly way to go. 
but it's easy to measure. You don't need to be drawing blood. You don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to. So what we do is this. I'm going to show a picture of just, we take amazingly good looking people. <laughs> a curiosity is we've tested ugly people I can't heal. Um, <laughs> So that's one, I mean, that's a clue, but I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret it. Uh, this, I'm only going to show pictures of me because I, I protect my, my, my volunteers. So there'll be a couple of pictures of me. Uh, and here, you, I, I'm treating a mouse. I'm going through this imaging technique. It may look like I'm meditating. I guarantee you I'm not meditating. I'm sitting there bored to tears. There's nothing more boring than healing. It's god-awful. And I'm sitting there, I can't tell you what I'm thinking. It would be censored. But I'm sitting there thinking, how did my life come to this? I'm sitting there day after day fondling mice. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a great place. You know, so I don't know how it got there. Uh, and you do it hour after hour. I mean, it, you know, it, it sounds exotic, but lab work can be extremely tedious. So we do this, and we sit there, and you can see five cages there. A bunch of things are going on. I have a geomagnetic probe going on. We've got random number generators running in the room. We're testing for, I mean, a lot of stuff is going on, and it really has got awful. So, Here's what happens. This is curious. This goes to the question, how should we think about healing? And what is the role of intention? And what's the role of attention? I expected, the first time I did this experiment, we'd get a cage of mice, we'd do our mental imaging, put our hands down, and we, they'd be injected. The first time we did it, we, we got to the mice three days after injection. Three days after injection, nothing big has happened, all that kind of stuff. So what we'll do is we'll go, you know, thinking of it as an analog to radiation. And we prevent it from growing. Now what happened instead is the tumor starts to grow. And I said, well, it didn't work. You know, end it, it was fun, let's move on. I got talked into, do it a couple more days. Keeps growing. A couple more days, a couple more days gets bigger and a blackened area appears on the tumor, and I'm sure this is terrible, the tumor then starts to ulcerate. And I'm sure these things are dying, the thing has failed, let's call it off and say, you know, it was, it was, it was a fun trip, but it didn't work. I still get talked into going a couple more days, and what happens is, the thing ulcerates. Now, you just saw a mouse that's in really bad shape. The eyes are still clear now. The coat's clear but I got this ugly thing that you're about to see. I get talked into against my objection. The tumor then implodes. The, mice is, the mouse is cured, and it's cured for life. It's pretty interesting. And I'm flopping on the floor, not knowing what to do with this. So here we go. Just a couple of pictures. Depends on, I don't know how good the angle is here and what we can see. I think the next one is, you can see the beginning of an ulceration. Now, that doesn't look like it's a good thing. Where do you see the next one? Now, look at the coat. Look at the coat. Coat's fine. I didn't carry this mouse because we only have a certain amount of time. Michelle's only going to give me five hours. But if I followed this mouse, it would implode, and it would live its normal lifespan. Different kind of cancer, sarcomas. Uh, notice the dosage. We give at least twice the lethal dosage. So this isn't a casual thing we're doing, and we're doing this in labs that do, have been doing this for 20 years. This, this particular sarcoma is a little bit, or this sarcoma is a little bit less aggressive than the mammary cancer, and it goes according to very similar kinds of patterns. So you can see it's, it's external. You can measure it. You can weigh it. You can do all those things. And the mouse dies in a pretty similar way. Now, if we do the this particular sarcoma gets better in a different way than the mammary cancer. One way is that the, you wake up one day and the tumor, like, it, like it, you let the air out of a balloon. The second thing that happens, which is pretty interesting, is that the mouse mysteriously grows an arrow on its back. We can't figure out where that comes from. Cure for cancer might be arrows. Uh, so in one, it, it just it lets uh, it's like the air came out, and another way you can see a similar kind of ulceration, 
and this will go to full cure. And once it's cured, it's cured for life. And by cured for life, I mean we can re-inject it for two years with cancer, and it laughs, it mocks us. The mouse is immune to cancer. We can do this with people, and so I'll just show you a couple of slides, though the, the people complain when you stick them in those little cages. And so, so this is a uh, six weeks apart uh, MRIs. We can do it by thermal imaging, we can do it by blood tests, we can do it by, we can do it by, we can do it by, that kind of stuff. So you, you get the plot. No mouse has ever had a recurrence. They're immune. As far as I know, no person has ever had a recurrence. And so the question, among the questions is, is there some immune response being stimulated which can then be used to perpetuate the cure going forward? And can we do traditional immunology to turn this into a conventional therapy? That's part of the plot. Uh, it's too ugly. Uh, here's, here's the other analog to this, or an extension of that. We can take cells out of a remitting tumor, one that's starting to implode, and put that into a fully infected mouse, no healer, no zzz, that mouse will be cured. And once a tumor has been treated, it will no longer seed forward. Meaning, you keep the cell line going by taking a tumor, you grind it up, you have the cells, you put it in, you keep it, another host, another host, another host. Won't do it anymore. So the, the cell line dies. The cancer's dead once you've done the treatment. That's reasonably interesting. Here's an additional observation. Healing uh, is not linear, and this goes to another question. How should we think about this? Healing occurs in sudden bursts, and this is true whether you're dealing with animal, vegetable, or mineral. So this is my favorite pictures ever. This is an ulceration, pretty obvious. It's not as big as the other one, but underneath you see day 22. You're going to see the same animal six days later. Six days. That's pretty cool. I'll do it again just because it's pretty cool. No objections, I can tell. It's pretty cool. And the only reason you can see anything is because the biologist is looking for the thing and is freaking out and flopping on the floor. So there is no sign of anything anywhere. You, we, do we do histology at all stages? There's cancer, there's cancer, there's cancer, there's cancer, there's cancer, there's cancer there's nothing. And it's cured for life. So even in imploding tumors, there's viable cancer cells. You can't hear? Raise it up. Should I start over? <laughs> I don't like this first slide. <laughs> so so we, get, we get these sudden bursts of things that go on. Uh, uh, the, the, it looks like it's getting worse, it's getting worse, and suddenly it changes. Suddenly it changes. So it's not this nice little linear path to cure. None of that ever happens. And things look, it's bumpy, it's up and down, nothing's happened, things are getting, and then it's gone, which is also pretty interesting. Now, to tie some of the stuff to Dean's earlier presentation, he was talking about random number generators. We've tried doing this. Let's say this is a random number generator. I'm pretty sure it's not, but this is a random number generator. And we do the, the mental imaging and the healing technique to the random number generator. Nothing happens. So we're treating it like it's a client you know, or it's sick or something like that, nothing happens. If we put the random number generator in a room and we treat mice in the room, that it goes wild. If the mice are cured, it no longer goes wild. That's pretty interesting. These are some geomagnetic probes that are in the room and in the hallways and around the campus and all over the place, and we get very anomalous waves. I'm not going to go into the detail, but we get very anomalous waves, and I'd be happy to give you details or academic papers, the kind of stuff nobody reads. Um, and so we, we, uh, we get these anomalous waves. We get these anomalous waves sudden, sudden, and then they'll last for, and then they're gone. And they happen in all the, my, the mouse rooms simultaneously. Once the mice are cured, it doesn't happen anymore. 
So if there's a need being expressed in the room, it happens. Other observations, just very quickly, if you put your hands out, spin the cage, mice don't like that, but you spin the cage, you put your hands out, as long as they have cancer, they'll move to your left hand. As soon as they're cured, they don't have anything to do with you. Makes no difference how the cage is aligned. Uh, these are interesting observations. So we go to, as, as I go through this, another question of my three questions. Is connection related to healing? I'm going to show you some EEG stuff. Again, this is with the same mental imaging techniques. And I'm going to show you some bonding with human subjects. Once again, we get really good looking people. And we do ugly things to them. So in this particular case, we a bunch of pairs, but you have a bunch of leads, a bunch of leads on someone else. We're sampling every 500th of a second, and that other person is someplace else. We do the techniques. I'm doing now, it, other people do this too. I'm doing the techniques. I'm doing this rapid mental imaging. Just as a, an aside, I'm doing it right now. It doesn't detract it any way from what I do. And so I, I'm sitting there, I'm doing the, the, the techniques, and then I think of the other person in another room, in another part of the building. So let's say Dean's over someplace else. Here's what happens. Two things happen. One, immediately our hearts go into synchronization. This is old news. We never even published this. It's old news. I mean, you got heart math, and they do this stuff pretty routinely. And what seems to happen, and this is just a qualitative observation, it's something along these lines. The person doing the imaging has the dominant heart. And so the person in the other room who's just hanging out, not doing anything consciously, just hanging out, their heart goes into then, they connect. And now they beat together. And they'll beat together as long as you're doing this. The brain of the person doing the mental imaging, don't take this too literally, goes to the other person and they kind of go into a resonance. And the brains go into a phase lock. That's pretty interesting too. Again, has nothing to do with belief. The person who's, and you get very anomalous readings, and we can, again, technical ease on other stuff, we should do that offline. Uh, but it, it, you get a signal that people don't see, and you get the signal that people don't see, and you get them in both brains simultaneously. This is pretty interesting. So let's go to healing and intention. And I'm phrasing it here, is healing different from PK, psychokinesis? Dean earlier talked of wonderful studies that were done at the Princeton Pear Lab, just as the one probably doing the most, where the, the operator sits there and with intention either makes the bouncing balls move to one side or the other, some deviation from chance, takes a random number generator of one sort or another using various forms of random number generation, and, and they will it, if you will, or they try to make the deviations so you had a normal distribution and it becomes slightly skewed. Statistically, actually, it doesn't become slightly skewed. There's a mean shift. Yeah, it's not, sorry. Uh, so it, it, there's a, mean, a statistically significant mean shift. That's willing. In other words, my task is to make the distribution go that way, or my task is to make the distribution go that way. I'm imposing my will on some random process. In the case of healing, as I mentioned, I initially thought I can impose my will on this process. So powerful me with my intention as an analog to making the random number generators come different, I'm going to prevent the cancer from growing. Well, tough. It grows. We've never been able to do it. It follows its own rules. It's not us imposing a system on nature. In the case of the random number generator, a physical system. In the case of cancer, a biological system. But it doesn't follow the same pattern. So if it were doing what I wanted it to do, I would pre get mice, prevent the cancer from growing, life is good. 
if the cancer grew, I take a, a mouse with cancer, impose my will, it would go through what I wanted to do. Uh, that never happens. Never. So the tumors develop, it does its own shtick. So consider this in the problem of how should we think of all this? Is healing a response to need, but isn't a response to this is what I am imposing on nature? So I'm going to show you another experiment. Healing cell medium. Now I'm moving now from in vivo stuff, bodies, living stuff, to in vitro stuff, cells in a dish. Not really, but cells in a dish. The cells in a dish in vitro have to be given nutrients and stuff in order to stay alive. So what happens if you treat the medium? So now the patient is a bottle of glop. Here's three bottles of glop. Standard off-the-shelf stuff. This is used, anybody here who's ever done cell culture stuff, you know exactly what you're looking at. So you're treating the cell medium. Now, I'll let you think about this for a second. So now I've got, I don't know how to phrase this, charged cell medium, treated cell medium, we did something to the cell medium, and now in that cell medium, I grow cancer. What should happen? So you're not sure, isn't that neat? That's why, that's why research is so much fun. Because you get to test your assumptions and you find out you're almost always wrong. I'm almost always wrong. Please stop listening to me. If I make a proposition, pfft, bet the ranch against it. So we're treating the medium and then we dump the cancer in. Slightly more involved than that, but you're, you're treating the medium, you dump the cancer in, how should the cancer respond? This is, and the reason I'm, I'm just letting this hang out there is because I want you to feel confused. I'm not interested in your comfort. What should happen? Well, you can see that it depends on how you think of healing. If healing is a psychokinetic effect, I can fix the cancer, I can prevent it from growing, I can, I'm a powerful guy. And so I do all that kind of stuff, and it bends to my will. But now I've just treated the medium. So it's got whatever X is in the medium. Interesting question. Now we dump the cancer cells in. What does it mean to have cancer in a treated medium? Now, a lot of people have a bias about cancer. And I'm, ho I'm harping on this because this is one of the few hypotheses I ever got right. Again, please don't listen to me. I predicted that if it's not a psychokinetic effect and we've got juiced up medium and we put cancer cells in there and if healing is a response to need, what should happen? It should thrive. We're healing cancer. What does cancer like to do? Well, it likes to reproduce. What if you give it juiced up medium? Wouldn't that help it? Now look at this. I'm not talking subtle stuff here. I'm talking minimum, because it depends, and we a 600% increase in cancer growth. That's not, we don't need to do a bunch of statistics on that. 600% increase in the, in the growth of cancer. Now my next prediction, which I haven't done yet, and I'm probably wrong, is I want to treat the medium, get some supercharged cancer, and put that supercharged cancer into a mouse. My prediction, it'll implode. As I suspect that healing is a response to need and will go to the higher order need. If it's just cancer, cancer has no need other than to reproduce. If it's cancer in a, in a body, that body has a need to get rid of the cancer. If we're sending the charge up and down the food chain, who's using it? Well, it depends what the need is. 
Cancer in a dish, oh boy, I got thank you notes from it. Cancer in a mouse, that supercharged cancer, should have more energy in the system, it should implode faster. Speculation, tentative, hasn't been done yet. Functional MRI, this is pretty interesting too. So functional MRIs, here's one of the ones I was wrong on. We go into a, a functional MRI measures blood flow in the brain, oxygenation per liter per, per volume per time, and it, and it works in a contrast mode. You've got to have an on, you've got to have an off. So you've all seen pictures of brains and it looks like parts are lit up. You know, so the, the, the right parietal lobe is lit up and, and, and you go, and people mistakenly say, oh look, that part is now working. You know, as if it's not otherwise. It's always working. And you get little shifts and all this kind of stuff. And it's, EEGs are actually, I think, more powerful than MR, functional MRIs. Uh, but we do on off. So my question was, can healing toggle? In which case, we could take it in MRI and do some experiments. Could healing toggle? Now my guess, again, I'm almost always wrong, is that it would not be able to toggle. In other words, the person using the techniques is going to be prompted in an MRI and say, on. And then you're supposed to do the techniques, and then they would say off, and then you're supposed to stop, and then on, and then off. I didn't think people were like light switches. You know, you turn them on, you turn them off, you turn them on, turn them off. So I said, yeah, let's do the experiment. My prediction is no, it won't work. Egg on my face. This is a control run. But we, we get pretty clear up and down. You can see, look at the, the little graph going up and down. Think of it now, again, we don't have time to go into the technical ease. I'd be happy to do it offline. On, off, on, off. On, off, on. It toggles. It's the damnedest thing. How do people toggle? So I report toggling. So we keep putting people in there. Do the technique, stop doing it, do it, stop doing it. Anybody can do this. It toggles on and off. I, I have, I'm not sure how to think about that. So we, once we knew it could toggle, then we could do a really interesting experiment. Double blind. Person lies in an enclosed MRI with their hands sticking out. Their task is to lie in an MRI with their hands sticking out. It's pretty simple to do. What do you do? Lie down. Show your hand. Do whatever you want to do. Not asking you to heal, not asking you to do mental imaging, not asking you to do anything at all. Just lie there with your hands sticking out. We have a bunch of envelopes, and the bunch of envelopes have been gotten from a veterinarian. Some of the envelopes are sham envelopes, there's nothing in them. Some of the envelopes have like one hair and a little picture of a cancerous animal 600 miles away, gotten from a vet. And some of the animals are horses, some of the animals are dogs, you got cats, we had, I think we had some sheep, we had some, and so we had all these, all these some of the cancer, some of the animals had cancer, some didn't, and they're all in this thing and it's blind. So the person's lying in there, they're not told to do anything at all, just lying in an MRI, and some guy in the experiment has a stack of envelopes, one, and then is prompted, put, drop, take out. Put the next envelope. Drop, take off. Drop, take off. Drop, take off. This is gonna sound bizarre, 100%. The brain turns on exactly like that when the envelope had a need. It did not turn on when the envelope didn't have a need. No conscious awareness at all. The person lying in the MRI is lying in the MRI, it's an ugly, noisy environment, it just goes blang, clang, and all this kind of stuff. The brain turns on in the same way as if you deliberately did it as Is it possible healing is an autonomic response to need? Now in my experiments, we've had enough people do this, so we have people who are extremely sensitive, some people who are bricks. All can heal. The extremely sensitive people, when they put their hands around a cage of mice, go, I can feel it. Ah, something's happening, and they get all a tingle, and this, that, and the other thing. And the bricks over here are going, what? 
and then they have Connection envy, you know, the, and so, so the, the people over there are getting all excited because of this feeling into this and that, and the bricks are just sitting there going, what? Doesn't make any difference in terms of healing efficiency. Whether you feel a connection or not, healing happens. Whether you know what you're doing or not, healing happens. Healing might, in fact, be an autonomic response to need, and the subjective sense of connection may or may not be experienced. Reasonably interesting. So, cautious summary, in the interest of time. Can non-healers be trained? Uh, it's not an interesting question anymore. Is there a relationship between healing and connection? Probably, but the connection might be a connection that's not necessarily conscious. And whether the person subjectively experiences it or not is, I'm not sure how to say this right, optional? Doesn't seem to matter in terms of efficacy. Is healing related to intention? It's not a psychokinetic effect in the sense of well, here I am willing the random number generator to go this way, willing the random number generator to go this way. I can will my brains out, nothing's gonna ha it doesn't make any difference. The mice go through the pattern that the mice go through. And it depends on the cancer, and there's all sorts of other things that we don't have time to do because Michelle's only gonna give me six hours. It doesn't seem to be a psychokinetic effect. The imaging technique has as an image that the thing is already done. And so, yes, there is an intention. Obviously, there is intention. You're putting your hands around a cage you know, for a certain length of time every day uh, till, uh, following the experimental protocol. But you do not seem to will the process. You clearly intend to get to the end where the mice are cured but you don't seem to be able to volitionally dictate the process by which you get from point A to point B. So the question is, can we capture it? And essentially, the question is, can we reverse engineer it? So here we have a cure. It's a cure, it's not a remission. Here we have a cure. You can take cells out and put it over there, and that'll be a cure. How many generations can you cure? Can we turn this into a conventional therapy? I think is a, is a worthwhile question. Basically, can we bottle it? And bottling we're using metaphorically. So could it, would it be a vaccine? Would it be a bottle? Would it be, I don't know, it's, it's beyond my pea brain ability to envision how this is going to come. But can we bottle it? I think it'd be fun to bottle it. Now the plan I have, just to let you know, if I can bottle it, I want to essentially, just for fun, because I'm a nasty, destructive person, give it away. Wouldn't that be fun? Folks, here's the cure. It's yours. And I do that only for destructive reasons. I don't like the industry. And so my initial targets, cancer, but we're also getting, and because I've taught some workshops on how to do this, and people are doing interesting things. Among the, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, because Michelle will only give me seven hours, is, is that um, some of the things work with this technique, some of the things don't work with it. And there's some things that d don't seem to have an effect at all. We try this clinically. Some of the stuff we go usually from clinical experience and then take it into the lab. Uh, among the things we don't seem to have any effect on at all, and I mean for all practical purposes, nothing, Parkinson's. Nobody who's learned these techniques, and the, you, know, you can have them for yourself, nobody who learns these techniques has to date been able to make an impact on Parkinson's. So someone who's got a shake, I mean you get a very minor reduction for very short term in some of the symptoms, but it's absolutely not impressive. And I would say, by any reasonable assertion, it's a failure. So some things don't respond, some things respond. Benign growths, for the most part, don't respond. Malignant growths respond. More than that, the more aggressive the malignancy, the easier it is to fix. Because I think the energy comes from the system. I don't think it's energy. 
So if the system has high energy and it's coming at you like a freight train, you get a treatment and it leaves like a freight train. Something that limps in, limps out. So you're looking for how fast does it leave? Depends how fast it comes back. It's almost like paying, playing the tape backward. Parkinson's, nothing. I mean nothing. But now a bunch of people, I've never tried this, but I got people from various places in the states independently reporting, and this is kind of cool, Alzheimer's. And they're talking about immediate dramatic re re reversal of Alzheimer's. I haven't tried it because I like to funnel rodents. But they're talking about doing this on people, and they're going, oh, yeah, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. And I'm, lo I'm looking at these practice groups, and I'm thinking there, of course, I'm a skeptic. I'm going, really? You can Alzheimer's? Yeah, and everybody's reporting you, you can do Alzheimer's. Maybe we can re reverse engineer something like that. We've done, if Alzheimer's is an inflammation problem, I've got a whole series of inflammation in vitro studies going on now. At Brown, they're very, very encouraging. We'll see. So we're looking to turn something unorthodox that came from a confused mixture of intention, attention, thought, consciousness, something that seems to take on a life of its own that we're just starting to understand and seeing if we can make this conventional. Let's take the gift that's just sitting in front of us and I'm trying to raise the labs and such to put the cure out. So I leave you with this probably violation of copyright. And I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>